you got your Bibles? Let's uh, turn to the book of 2 Samuel. And uh, we're going to go to 2 Samuel chapter 7, and we're going to take another look here. Okay, so uh, yeah, we, we actually listened to Blake's teaching on the way through Washington State, and I thought, there's a few things I got to straighten out here. So, no, I'm just kidding. It was awesome. It was awesome. And what Blake and I talked about actually before we went away was this, as I said, this chapter is so important. This chapter is so good. I'm going to hit it a second time when we get back and try and have another look. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to take a peek at 2 Samuel chapter 7, and uh, let's pray this morning. Let's, let's pray for our province too. There's lots going on. And, uh, and so Lord Jesus, we just thank you that we could come before you this morning, your church. We want to be a praying people. And so, God, we lift up to you just the province of British Columbia. Wow, Lord. People are giving credit to all sorts of things. All, their hearts are full of many questions. And you're trying to get the attention of the lower mainland. And so, Lord, uh, we want to turn our, direction, our hearts in the correct direction. That's towards you in the midst of this. And say, Lord, would you... Uh, would you turn the hearts of people towards you? We pray, God, that you would have mercy on Vancouver, on the lower mainland, on the province of BC. We pray, God, that you would help us in the midst of this to love our neighbors well, to be representatives of your kingdom, God, to serve. And Lord, we pray that, that you would just move mightily in the province of BC. God, we pray that that the people of BC would not shake their fists towards heaven, but that their hearts would turn towards you in the midst of this. We ask this, Lord, that you'd send a revival, that you'd awaken the hearts of people, that you'd awaken the heart of your church, that you would turn men and women towards King Jesus. And so, Lord, uh, we, we lift up BC to you. We pray this morning, God, as we dig into your word, uh, that you'd speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Yeah, such an important Old Testament passage that we thought we'd give it a couple weeks of attention. You know, when we come to this chapter in our Bible, let me just remind you, we've been spending time here in, in the account of Samuel, the narrative of Samuel. Um, in our Bibles here, David's rule is established. Jerusalem is established as the capital. The Ark of the Covenant, we've seen this. It's been brought brought to the city of Jerusalem. David sees himself living in this beautiful palace, and yet he recognizes this, that the tabernacle where God's people gathered to worship uh, was a tent. The Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God was dwelling in a tent, and it had always been in a tent from the time of Moses. But David got this vision in his heart and in his mind that he wanted to build a house for the ark and for the people of God, a place for the people of God to gather, to worship, to bring offerings before the Lord. And so David in this chapter does this. He expresses his desire to build a permanent home, a temple to house the ark of the covenant, a, a, a temple, a, a house that will be the centerpiece of the worship of the living God. And so David told the prophet Nathan his plans and his desire. This is what the Second Samuel chapter 7 tells us. His intentions, he made them known to Nathan. And Nathan said, this is awesome. David, this is a great vision. Everything that is in your heart, you should just go do it. Go do it. And that night, after they had just celebrated the two of them, excited about the work of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Nathan and he told him this, David is not the one to build me a house. Uh, the desire is honorable. It's good. But David is a man of blood. David has shed a lot of blood. And it wasn't a condemnation, uh, a condemning word from the Lord against the actions of David. He was a warrior king. It was just the Lord saying this, the man who builds my house is going to be a man of peace. And so through the prophet Nathan, the Lord said to David this, I, I've always dwelt in a tent. Amongst all the years that I have been with my people, I've always dwelt in a tent. And I've never asked anyone to build me a house. And what you desire, it is honorable. 
but I don't need you to rescue me. I don't need you to build me anything. In fact, David, let me point something out to you. It's I who've been doing things for you. I took you from the pasture. I took you from following your father's sheep. I took you from the sheep fold and I anointed you to be prince over my people. And I've been with you and I've anointed you and I've established you and I have made your name great. And I have made your name great like the greatest of kings in all the earth. And I have given you rest from your enemy. And now, David, besides all that, if that wasn't enough, if everything that I haven't done for you was enough, I, Yahweh, the Lord, tell you, I declare to you that you're not going to build me a house. I'm going to build one for you. And David had these plans uh, to make the Lord a house. And through the prophet, the Lord is saying, you're not going to make me a house. Instead, I am going to build you a house. And the house that the Lord spoke of in this passage here is not a physical building, but a family line, a progeny, a, a descendants, a lineage that would be a throne established forever and ever. The Lord said to David, I am going to build you a house and one of your descendants will forever sit on the throne of David in the house of Israel. Forever. It's like awesome. It's a long time, isn't it? That's a long time. An everlasting throne that perpetually will exist through all eternity. That's what the Lord said to David. I'm going to do it. I'm going to build the house. And God says to David that he will raise up this descendant, this offspring, Literally in Hebrew, the word is seed, which takes us back to the book of Genesis. Actually, if you got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Let you get there. Because this, in chapter 7, is a reference all the way back to the book of Genesis and to chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 is, actually 3 verse 15 is, I always like this word, but it's called the proto-evangelum. Which means this, the first gospel. This is the first declaration of the gospel in the scriptures. It's found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the proto-evangelum. And it says this. I want to read to you from the New King James because it actually uses the word seed. So it'll be on your screen, but it's, it's worth underlining your Bible. The Lord says this. This is after the fall of Adam and Eve. He says this. Speaking to Eve. And I will put enmity between you, or sorry, speaking to the sermon, serpent. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now the ESV says rather than seed, it says offspring. Between your offspring and his offspring. And Genesis 3.15 is the first announcement of the gospel in the scripture. The good news that one day a time will come when one will come, the seed of a woman... And he will come and he will crush the head of the serpent. The devil will be defeated by the seed of the woman. The proto-evangelum, the first gospel, the first announcement of good news that a savior is going to come and he is going to bring salvation. And this is the overtone of 2 Samuel chapter 7. Flip back to 2 Samuel chapter 7. And let's take a look at verse 12. And actually again I'm going to read to you from the New King James Version. Just for the sake. Because it uses the word seed. Now it says this. Verse 12. When your days are fulfilled. This is the Lord speaking to David. When your days are fulfilled. And you rest with your fathers. I will set up your seed after you. Who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. It's this descendant whose rule and whose throne will endure forever. And this is important. This is why this chapter is important. This is important to our understanding of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his rule. And the Lord says this about this descendant that he, it is he who will build me a house. Again, look at. Verse 13, 2 Samuel 7, 13. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Man. 
Now, this is a double meaning. Like, when you read this, and this is one of these scriptures that's full of double meanings. Uh, of course, we know this. It's Solomon, the son of David, who built the temple of the Lord where the Ark of the Covenant was housed. But the double meaning of this passage is this, is that it's Jesus, that it's pointing us to Jesus. And Jesus, the house that he is building for the Lord is this, is that Jesus is making, has made a way for God to dwell with human beings, for the Lord to house himself in another temple. Paul said this, don't you know? You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the dwelling place of God's presence. Peter said this, that you and I are being built together. He said, once you were not the people of God, but now you have been made the people of God. You have received mercy. Once, at one point in time, you did not have mercy, but now you have received mercy. And Peter said, like living stones, God is building his house. He's building his church, a place for him to dwell, where we are to offer to him spiritual sacrifices. David, Nathan prophesied to David this, it's the Lord it's this descendant who is going to build this house and he will rule over this eternal kingdom. This is the covenant with David, the Davidic covenant. That God will establish his house and God will establish his throne and establish one of his descendants who will rule on David's throne forever. Look at, this is an important text of scripture. This is, this is why we would say this, that 2 Samuel Chapter 7 is the centerpiece. It is the pinnacle of the entire narrative of the book of Samuel. First and second Samuel. This is it. This is the most important chapter. Now, you might not have thought that. You might have thought, well, I really love First Samuel chapter 3. I, I love the story of little young Samuel sleeping in the presence of God before the Ark of the Covenant. And the Lord called his name. And he, he didn't know what was going on. So he went to Eli. And it took him a while to figure out that the Lord's call was on his life. I mean, you might love that chapter. Or you might love 1 Samuel 17, where David defeats Goliath with a sling and a stone. And it's so adventurous and, and awesome. You might love all the heroic, heroic stories of the warrior David. But 100%, whether it's the story of Samuel, the story of David and Goliath, all the great victories of David, they have all led us to this point. This is the pinnacle. This is it, to this promise, to this covenant. This chapter prepares us for what to look for, what to expect in the coming of the great king, what to expect in the coming of the Messiah? This chapter prepares us for the coming of Jesus, church. I was thinking about this. Like, what would you do with your Bible if you just took 2 Samuel chapter 7 out of the Bible? Let's say we could just plunk that one out, out of the narrative of Samuel. What if it wasn't there? What would it mean for us? Would we know what to look for? Would we know who we're looking for? Would we know... That it's a descendant of David who's going to rise to the throne of Israel and be there forever. This chapter sets the stage to help us know what to look for in the coming of the Lord's anointed. It's giving us hints and prophecies. We know this. This great king, he will be of David's seed. He will rule on David's throne. He will be in that position forever. He will hold an eternal reign and he will be the descendant of David. And he will build God a house, a spiritual house. God's doing that with your life. Jesus has done this. He has taken your life that was marred by sin. He bore your sin in his body. He took it to a tree. He was nailed Onto that tree, he bore the wrath of God in your place. He died, and the Lord raised him from the dead. And Jesus takes your life that was, that was under the power of sin, that was marred by sin, subject to its power. And by the power of God and the work of the cross, Jesus has caused you to be born unto salvation. You've been born again. You've been made a new creation in Christ Jesus. You have been born of the Spirit. And Jesus says this, you've become the house of God. The dwelling place of the spirit of God. His spirit dwells in you. We are his temple. 
Jesus is building the Lord a house. And we know this, that this descendant of David will so closely be aligned with the will of God that he won't just be a descendant of David. It will be as though when you read this text that God is his father and he is the son of God. I would say this, this text tells us this is, this is another reason why the virgin birth is so important. Why it's so important to the account in the history of Jesus' birth. He was a descendant of David through his mother Mary. And through the man that raised him, his stepfather Joseph, he was a descendant of David. But Jesus was conceived in Mary's womb when the Holy Spirit over, overshadowed her womb. He was born of a virgin. She was a virgin. God was his father. Check out verse 14. 2 Samuel 7, 14. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. We'll come back and read the rest of this in a minute. But th th this, is the, this is the reason why our gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell us that when Jesus referred to Yahweh as his father, men wanted to kill him and stone him to death for the sin of blasphemy. They said that by calling God his father, he was making himself equal with God and therefore declaring himself to be God. And they were right. It was blasphemy unless he really was who he claimed to be. And he is. John 3.16 declares that Jesus is the one and only Son of God. This is why these words to David, this prophecy, this, this covenant is so exciting. But when you read the rest of the, this text, let's check it out. It, it might throw you off because it says this. I will be a father. Sorry. I will be to him a father and he will be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the sons of of men. Do I have verse 15 on there too? Good, because I don't have it in my notes. So I'm going to read it this way. But my steadfast love will not depart for him, from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. Now, when you read this, it's kind of like, yeah, it's, it's like, wait a minute. When he sins, when he sins, did Jesus sin? I, I thought this was a reference that this whole text was a reference to the coming of Jesus. This doesn't sound like Jesus when you read the back half of these verses. And, and you're right. It doesn't sound like Jesus. In fact, it's, it's not about Jesus. That's because this isn't, I would say, a direct messianic prophecy in terms of a prediction of something that's going to happen. This divine promise is setting us up to read the rest of Samuel, to read First and Second Kings, to read about the descendants of David's line. And we're going to discover this about them in the reading of Scripture. You know this, that every single one of them fails miserably. None of them live up to what Nathan prophesied to David. None, none of them ever live up to the humble faith that David himself had. We, we read the accounts of all the kings and all the descendants of David. And we, we have to go, okay, well, is this the one? Is this the seed that is going to sit on the throne of Israel forever? And we go, no, that guy failed. That guy failed. That one sinned. This one failed to fulfill the promise to David until we get to Jesus. Until we get to Jesus. We read this text and there's overtones of Solomon and the descendants of David, but no one fulfills these words until we turn the pages to the New Testament and we read about Jesus. That's the shocking thing in our Bibles. The line of David... The house of David, the descendants of David, ran the nation of Israel into the ground. They drove it into the ground. You read the books of First and Second Kings, and it's like total failures, and yet this divine promise stands and hangs over the people of God. The enduring hope. The enduring hope that this king is going to come. And he won't be like the rest of these failure kings. He'll sit on the throne of David forever and he will rule for eternity. And so 2 Samuel chapter 7 is so important because 
It does so much groundwork for us. This is what all the prophets were speaking about. You know, in our Bible, in 90 days, we're going to be going into, we're, we're looking at Ezekiel this week, and we're going to get into the minor prophets. And as we heard in the announcements, we're almost to the New Testament, almost. And we got to get through those prophets, but all of those prophets are looking forward with visions of a future messianic king. That's the hope that we read about when we read the prophetic books. One day, a king is going to come, and he will not repeat the failures of Saul or the other sons, the seeds of David. He'll be like David. He won't be like Saul. He won't be like Solomon. This king will be like David, and like David, he'll come from Bethlehem. He'll be his father's only son. David was the youngest. The, the text tells us that amongst his brothers, he was considered the, the one who was worthless. That there was nothing about David that would draw you to him. But he had a heart for God. And, and this king, this messianic king, will be a king with a radical trust in God like David had, who will allow his father to exalt him at the proper time. Like David, he will have no features to mark him as God's anointed. Isaiah prophesied this about him. He won't shove or push his way into power. He will be a true king whom God will raise up and he will rule forever. Psalm 2 looks forward to this reign. Turn, turn your Bible to Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2 is titled in your Bible, The Reign of the Lord's Anointed. Let's read this. Verse 1 says this. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. What a great psalm. A great psalm that encourages us. Take refuge in the Lord's anointed. Make Jesus your safe harbor. Make the Lord Jesus Christ the one in whom you trust. The psalmist says this, that the nations of the earth will rage against the Lord's anointed. They'll plot. How can we like bust free from the rule of Jesus, the eternal king? And it's pretty funny. The text tells us this, that the Lord is laughing. <laughs> This is hilarious to the Lord. It's comical. It's like the funniest thing in the entire universe. To think that you can be set free from a king whom God has set on an eternal throne. God laughs. He laughs. It's a funny thing to the Lord because he has declared that his son, that the rule of his anointed will be forever and the father will give all of the nations to that son. His only begotten. And Jesus will rule over all nations with a rod of iron. So the Lord warns. The psalmist warns the rulers of the earth. You should serve God with fear and trembling. You should kiss the sun. That's what it says there. Kiss the sun. Which is like the idea of like kiss and make up. Make up. Lest you perish in your rebellion. The warning is this. 
You can't shake your fist at the Lord's anointed and not expect to experience his wrath. And you don't know when his wrath is going to be kindled. So you have to take advantage of the day of grace while it's available. It's an advantageous step for you to kiss the sun and to seek his favor during the days of grace. The Bible says this, that rebellion against the sun is sin. It's called sin. And the Bible tells us that we have to repent of our sins, kiss the sun, turn from our rebellious sins, and he will do this. Well, we want to do it before he outpours his wrath, and then he will do this. He will give us refuge if we will come to him. This is a change of heart. From, re from living in rebellion to seeking refuge in Christ Jesus, the Lord. And this is the attitude the psalmist says we, we have to take with regards to Jesus. We turn from our sin and rebellion. We kiss and make up and we turn in repentance to faith and taking refuge in Christ Jesus. And the psalmist says this. Blessed is everyone who does that. Blessed is everyone who takes refuge in him. To take refuge in Jesus means that you put your trust in him. And the psalmist says, you'll be blessed. Blessed simply means this. You'll be happy. You'll have joy. You'll sense, the, you'll sense the goodness and grace of God. Happy are all who trust in Jesus. Doesn't Jesus make you happy? Isn't the joy of the Lord your strength, church? In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John were arrested for preaching Jesus. They came and were brought before the council and they shared to the council. The council said, you got, you got to stop preaching Jesus. And they said, we can't stop. And they chatted with them. And, and the Bible tells us in Acts 4 that the council noted that Peter and John were unschooled men. But I'll tell you what, they schooled the council because the spirit of God had anointed them. And when they Left from before the council, they gathered with the church. And Acts chapter 4 tells us that the church rejoiced. That they had been set free and that they had had the opportunity to share about the goodness of God. Before these rulers of the earth. And the church did this. The church prayed. They said, let's pray. Let's seek the God. Let's seek God. Let's, let's ask that, that God would fill us with boldness to continue to preach Jesus to all who would hear. And in Acts chapter 4, they quoted from, in their prayers, they quoted from Psalm 2. They said, Lord, you said it, that the nations would rage against your son, the Lord's anointed. And we ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we would be bold to preach Christ, to share Christ in spite of however the nations rage. Isn't that need, doesn't that need to be our prayer? That no matter how the nations rage, Though the earth be tossed to and fro, though floodwaters come and pandemics, that we just be bold to preach Christ Jesus. And they prayed. They prayed that they would speak the word of the Lord with boldness. And that God in, the midst of, in their midst would stretch out his hand. And he would heal. And that there would be signs and wonders. And, and that they would be performed through the name of Jesus Christ. And when they prayed, the word of God says this. The place where they met, it was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Turn with me in Psalms to Psalm 89. Psalm 89. It's titled this. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord. This is a great psalm because the context of this psalm, Psalm 89. Maybe you want to write it beside the title. 2 Samuel 7. That's the context. This is a psalm that has to do with 2 Samuel chapter 7. This is the, the background and the future that is being considered is the Davidic covenant. The promise to David. The promise that one would rule on the throne forever. That's the background. That hope. The hope surrounding the fulfillment of the promise that one of David's descendants would rule forever. And Psalm 89, I would say this, it's like a prayer. It's a prayer. Because it was written in a time when Israel had been humbled. 
When the people of God had been humiliated in the face of their enemies, the walls of Jerusalem were breached. Their enemies were laughing at them in scorn. But the psalmist expressed his trust that Yahweh would fulfill his promise to David. And Psalm 89 is like looking forward to the coming of Jesus. The day when God guaranteed to David that his kingdom would continue to his descendants. So let's read this. Psalm 89, verse 1. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said, steadfast love will be built up forever in the heavens. You will establish your faithfulness. Church, this is why we sing. You know, I was just reminded of this even just in preparation for this message. It was like the power of God's people singing, the church singing. It's very unique to Christianity and those who follow Jesus. We sing of the steadfast love of the Lord. That's why when the public health officer called here. And said, hey, there's no singing. I said, I don't have any right to tell the people of God not to sing. They're not, they're not an audience watching the worship team. They are active participants in, in the worship of Almighty God. The people of God sing. And this psalmist goes on. And he says this. He, he actually quotes the words of, pro, of the prophet Nathan. Check it out. Verse 3 and 4. You'll recognize it. Because we've just read it in 2 Samuel chapter 7. Verse 3, you have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Look, the correct response to this is worship. The right response is to sing of the steadfast love of the Lord. Look at verse 5. That's what the psalmist says. Let the heavens praise. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. <laughs> We're the assembly of God. The, 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 the sons and daughters of God who have put our faith and trust in God's anointed. We sing. I want to read on. I'm just going to read this, most of this psalm, actually. Let's go verse 6. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord, a God greatly to be feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him? O Lord God of hosts, who is as mighty as you are, O Lord? With your faithfulness all around you, you rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You crushed Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it. You have founded them. The north and the south. You have created them. Tabor and Hermon. The awesome mountains in Israel. Tabor and Hermon. Joyously praise your name. You have a mighty arm. Strong is your hand. High your right hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face, who exalt you in your name all day and in your righteousness are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord, our God, to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. Isn't this awesome? Let's read on. Verse 19. Of you, of, sorry, of old you spoke in a vision to your godly one and said, I have granted help to the one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from my people. I have found David my servant with my holy oil. I have anointed him so that my hand shall be established with him. My arm also shall be strengthened. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and my steadfast love shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. 
He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And I will make him the firstborn. Colossians 1.15, Paul talks about that. And I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My steadfast love, I will keep for him forever, and my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his offspring forever and his throne as the days of the heavens. If his children forsake my law and do not walk according to my rules, if they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with a rod and their iniquity with stripes. But I will not remove him from my steadfast love or be false to my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant. Or alter the word that went forth from my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness. I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever. His throne as long as the sun before me. Like the moon it shall be established forever. A faithful witness in the skies. This is an awesome psalm about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the hope of one who will sit on the throne of David forever. The Davidic covenant is so awesome. Second Samuel chapter seven is so awesome. Psalm two, Acts four, Psalm 89, all of these things telling us and pointing us to one in whom we put our trust and our hope, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning, I just want to tell you this. If you have put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, it wasn't a mistake. You didn't misstep. You've put it in the exact place where it's supposed to be. In the, tr- in, 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 the, in the one whom the Lord God Yahweh said would rule on the throne of David forever. I love these texts. And I think about it. It just, it just means this. That, 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 that Jesus is God's anointed ruler. The son of God. And God has purposed. He will sit on the throne Forever, And so these texts are so important because they do this for us. They help us identify the Savior of the world. They help us recognize God's anointed ruler. They help us identify Jesus. The New Testament writers were working all to this end. The prophets of the Old Testament were working all to this end so that there would be no mistake in all the universe who they were speaking of. We're not mistaken. You put your trust in Christ, you have put it in the right spot. Kiss the sun. Kiss the sun. The psalmist says this, that God does not lie. He fulfilled the words of Nathan in Jesus. He fulfilled the covenant with David and the person of Jesus. The psalmist says in Psalm 2, he expressed that the nations would rage against the plan of God That they would rebel against God's anointed or they could choose to take refuge in him. Let us be those who take refuge in the Lord's anointed. The writer of Psalm 89 worshipped the Lord. And he reassured himself of the covenant of David and the steadfast love of the Lord. The promises made to David even when they looked out and said, Lord, it seems like scorn and trouble has come upon us. And we don't understand what's going on. I will sing of your steadfast love and I will not forget your covenant to David. See, putting your hope in Jesus is that exactly. It's hope. (laughs) Jesus is a source of hope. These, These texts are about messianic hope. They're about living hope. They're about the blessed hope. We are people filled with hope when we put our trust in Jesus. Isn't it true? Jesus is the highest of the kings of the earth and his dominion and his rule Is forever. And if we forsake him. Or forsake his law. And not walk according to his ways. His word says this. He will punish that transgression. To not walk in his ways is. Rebellion. It's sin. It's to make yourself subject to the wrath of God. But. Jesus has made a way. For those who are in a position of wrath and sin and their lives given over to such things, he bore their sin in his body. Went to the tree, the cross. There he was crucified and died and was raised to life. And he offers refuge. 
The eternal king offers rescue, refuge, happiness, blessing. We've been born again into an eternal kingdom, amen? And our trust in Christ is to be active and working. May the Lord fill us with boldness. I'm going to invite the worship team to come. Would you guys stand with me? We'll, we'll close in prayer. These guys will lead us in a song. We've gone a little over this morning, but uh, hey. Lord Jesus, we just declare that we trust you this morning. Lord, if um, anyone who's watching with us online or participating with us here this morning, God is walking in rebellion against you. Lord, I pray right now that with a heart of repentance and a heart of faith that they would turn from their sin and kiss the son, lest his wrath be kindled. And so, Lord, we do that this morning. In our hearts, we turn from our sin, Lord. We repent. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, God, of serving these things. From trying to shake off your rule. Lord, we turn to you this morning and we kiss the sun. We want to make up, Lord. We ask that you'd forgive us our sins and purify us from our unrighteousness. We thank you, Jesus, that you are a righteous king who rules forever. Your throne will endure for eternity. And Lord, you make us happy. You bring us joy. You're the blessing of our lives. And so, Lord, this morning... We bless you. May may you be pleased, Lord, as we worship you. May, Lord, you laugh with joy this morning as we sing of your steadfast love. We bless you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.